Um, uh, hi, everyone. So we are today, we're very happy to have Brian Swingle from Brandeis uh, giving a talk on hydrodynamics and the spectral form factor. Brian's work doesn't need introduction. So he's an amazing physicist and he's gonna teach us a lot of interesting things about hydrodynamics and chaos and more. Please. Okay, well, thanks for that. That's a very kind, um, it's a high bar now. Uh, yeah, so today, I thanks for inviting me to speak. I wish I could be with you in person, but still good to see you all. And um, yeah, today I'm gonna to talk about hydrodynamics and the spectral form factor. Hydrodynamics is something we totally think about having to do with the motion of energy and charge and other conserved quantities at long wavelength and low frequency. Um, and spectral form factor is something that we use to diagnose the statistical properties of energy eigenvalues, typically. And what I'll describe here is a relationship between those two things, which I view as sort of explaining or rationalizing the, the origin and the universality of random matrix behavior in chaotic systems in terms of hydrodynamics. Okay, so that's kind of the big picture of where we're going. So let me first talk about quantum chaos, which is the kind of umbrella concept we're thinking about here. And to start off, you know, let me remind you that there is such a thing as classical chaos, which is a, a very interesting and complicated subject. Um, one, aspect that I find particularly a nice way to phrase things is to view classical chaos as something to do with deterministic randomness. So it's a deterministic system that sort of behaves in a very random fashion. Probably the thing you're most familiar with, or at least you've heard about is the butterfly effect, Lyapunov exponents, et cetera. But there's an extremely rich theory there and a lot of interesting phenomenology and mathematics. And then sort of in, in the quantum side of things, my, I'm not a historian of science, but my impression of the sort of origins of this field were thinking about the quantum signatures of classically chaotic systems. This is something that Barry called quantum chaology, um, because some people argue that you really couldn't have chaos per se in quantum systems because the Schrodinger equation was linear. So how can you have like exponential divergence of trajectories? Now, I think that's really the wrong analogy. But nevertheless, this is a part of the story, and it's an important part, and it's one of the origins of the story. But these days, the sort of more modern view is that we should have a kind of fully quantum definition of chaos. Maybe, maybe we should have used a different word, but, but anyways, this is what we have. So we want to have some kind of quantum notion of chaos. But at present, I would say that Quantum chaos is a somewhat vague or nebulous concept that encompasses a lot of different phenomena. These phenomena typically co-occur. So you pick your favorite model that you call quantum chaotic. And this model will have lots of different features that come from this list that I put below. But nevertheless, we don't typically have sharp connections that say, okay, you know, random matrix level statistics implies complexity growth or butterfly effect implies hydrodynamics or whatever, right? These things typically co-occur, but we are still lacking sharp links between many of them. So just to go through a few of the things here, um, there's what I call sensitivity. So this is like Loschmidt echoes, out of time order correlators, quantum butterfly effect kind of stuff. That's one way to characterize chaos. Um, there's randomness. Like the, the, the energy eigenstates can look random, that's an eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, or that the levels, energy levels can look random, like those of our, like the eigenvalues of a random matrix. That's the famous RMT random matrix theory conjecture, which grew out of Wigner's insights about the properties of complex um, nuclei. There's ideas of complexity that, okay, chaotic systems should have complexity that grows with time and that producing eigenstates should be a very complicated thing to do. And then there's a sort of more observable side of things, which is we normally think of associating thermalization also with chaos. So chaotic systems thermalize, they come to equilibrium and they have, you know, sort of ordinary transport, ordinary meaning like diffusive transport, possibly with sound if you have the right symmetries, et cetera. So as I said, there's kind of a rich spectrum of physical phenomena 
they typically co-occur, but we don't have necessarily the most um, as strong of links between these different things as we'd like. And so this talk is going to be about connecting random matrix level statistics with hydrodynamics. A uh, question, Brian? Yeah, please. Um, are you going to say anything about the connection with complexity? So you said that if the complexity grows linearly in time, you want to call that model chaotic. Is that what you want to say? Um, well, so the, to answer your first question, no, I will not say anything about complexity apart from this exchange here and any future questions. Um, but yeah, you you know, I, I'm not sure again if it's if it's one to one, but we certainly think, or at least I think, that in a chaotic system, the complexity will grow linearly in time for a long time. And I think that's not true in simple integrable systems. You know like Clifford circuits, it's not true. Free fermions, it's not true. I'm not sure about say, like beta onsatz integrable systems there, I don't know, but. I see, thank but, you. Yeah, that, that would be the intuition. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. And yeah, please don't hesitate to, to ask questions at any point. So yeah, so that's what this talk is about. Now, before I go on to the main content, let me try to convince you that this is a good time to think about these topics. Um, the first, and I think extremely interesting and most important reason is that experimentally now it's increasingly possible to probe the dynamics of isolated many body systems far from equilibrium. And in this regime, you very naturally probe many of these different manifestations of chaos. You probe thermalization, you can actually do experiments that probe, that probe uh, out of time order correlators and scrambling. And uh, you, you, know, you can study entanglement dynamics. So this is all possible and interesting. And so that, there's a strong experimental motivation to understand the isolated dynamics of many body systems. Of course, there's eventually some bath or environment that takes over, but you can still probe a long time scale typically in many of these modern experiments. Um, on the more theoretical side, we got a lot of new tools and techniques and insights from quantum information that have shed light on chaos especially thinking about the physics of chaos in terms of randomness and quantum randomness and different ways of quantifying that from you know, unitary designs to entanglement growth to uh, you know, hayden presco like protocols, et cetera. Now, chaos is also turns out to be very important in the context of ADS-CFT and, and black holes more generally for explaining how black holes process information, how information is effectively hidden, and how it can ultimately come out again, um, if it does. And then something that's kind of dear to my heart from earlier days in my PhD was, is the, the physics of strongly correlated quantum many body systems. So think about uh, high temperature superconductors or other strongly interacting electron systems where you have very interesting phases of matter and oftentimes complicated, hard to understand dynamics for example, unusual kinds of transport of charge. And uh, again, here too, we have some understanding and some expectation that if we have a deeper grasp of quantum chaos and its different manifestations and their relations, we can perhaps understand better how to do something practical like calculate the transport properties of a strongly interacting system. And I won't talk about that really here, but I'm happy to go into that in more detail afterwards if you're, if you're interested. So let's get to this talk. What I'm going to talk about is based primarily on this paper I wrote with my student, Mike Weiner, um, from, I guess, last year. And the quantity of interest, the key quantity of interest, is called the spectral form factor. It's defined the following way. You take time evolution operator, which is what I call U of T. Capital T always stands for time in this talk, never for temperature. I think that's true. Um, so it's always time. There's no temperature here yet. I'm just taking the time evolution operator for some time. I'm taking a trace of it. So that's like return amplitude. I start in some initial state, I evolve in time, and I return to the same state, and I sum over all such states. I take that quantity, which is the trace of u. I compute its absolute value squared. And now as a function of time, that quantity is typically an erratic function of time. It'll have all kinds of crazy wiggles and stuff because it depends on the fine grained details of the energy levels. 
And so what we typically do is average that quantity over disorder, meaning over some ensemble of Hamiltonians. And what that averaging will do is sort of wash out or smooth out the erratic stuff and leave behind some universal structure that we can try to explain and understand. And what you typically find for this quantity is that if the system is chaotic, and actually for some people, this is like the definition of quantum chaos, um, you'll see that this spectral form factor behaves like the spectral form factor of a random matrix at quote unquote intermediate time. So after everything is relaxed and the system has come to global thermal equilibrium, it looks like a random matrix in terms of its spectral properties. And this spectral form factor will just be linear in time out to exponentially long times. So that's the expectation. And the reason why I say this probes the spectrum is that essentially you have two different energies. We have an energy from this term and an energy from this term. And when you compute this disorder average, you're basically looking at the averaged energy pair correlation function. And for various reasons, it's more convenient physically to think about that in the time domain instead of the energy domain. So we essentially Fourier transform that paracorrelation function, and that's the spectral form factor. So you should think of the spectral form factor as just the Fourier transform of the energy paracorrelation function of your Hamiltonian. So you pick a pair of energies, you look at the correlations between them, between the density of energy eigenvalues, and as a function of energy, and then you Fourier transform that, and that's spectral form factor. Um, so the big yeah. question, Brad. Please. So does it depend on the initial state that you or like you said, you start from some state yeah. evolve and then come back to the state? Yeah, it, it, in principle, it, it could. I mean, here we're sort of summing over all possible initial states. So there won't be any dependence, but you can define analogous quantities where you insert operators or choose specific states here instead of a trace. And that quantity will also be sensitive to the spectral properties, but it'll know also about the initial state or the operator you put in there. Okay. And so then you have a more complicated structure. So this is kind of the, the bare bones thing, which just zeroes in on the spectrum and treats all states in a totally uh, egalitarian way. But you mentioned that your average disorder averaging over Hamiltonian. So which the spectral of which Hamiltonian will you be? looking at well we, we compute this for some for for a single ensemble for a single member of the ensemble we compute this trace then we square it and then we average that over the ensemble so the ultimate quantity will not be a property of any particular hamiltonian but of some average set of hamiltonians Does that make sense yeah thank you all right yeah, and so the, the big question, the big picture question is under oh, what Sorry, quick question. Sorry, yeah, Brian. Quick please. question, related question. That's why I want to ask. So this is like an infinite temperature thing, right? Correct, yeah. So if you introduce temperature, you expect whatever, we should, we should keep in mind that whatever you're saying is going to be holding for time scales that are much uh, larger than beta. Right? Is that right? Uh, that's right. Yeah. So I. So first of all, I will explicitly talk about temperature and that kind of stuff in a second. Um, but yes, you should imagine this behavior will be valid for times long compared to any like intrinsic time scale or relaxation time in the system, in particular, longer than beta, but shorter than the inverse level spacing time. Thank you. And yeah, so again, quickly, the big picture question is, under what conditions is this behavior realized in physical Hamiltonians? What's sort of remarkable is you go out and pick your favorite quantum spin chain or, or quantum field theory or interacting particle system or whatever you like. And unless it's specially tuned to inter integrability, you always see this behavior in the spectrum. So it's kind of super universal. And we'd like to understand what's the origin of that and how to think about it. So this slide is just to alert you that there's a lot of uh, work on this topic. I mean, in particular, there's kind of an older quantum chaos literature, which did connect um, the sort of emergence of random matrix-like behavior with 
for example, diffusion, that you needed to wait for the system to sort of settle into diffusive equilibrium before you could expect to see random matrix behavior. And we'll see a similar kind of conclusion later in the talk here. Um, in the context of many body models, there's been a lot of recent nice analytical calculations in various toy models. Um, this Bertini Coast Prozen paper, for example, is a spin chain where you can exactly calculate the spectral form factor and show that it's exactly linear in time as you would expect. And then there are a lot of other works in various kinds of um, like Floquet models and Hamiltonian models. For example, Sajshanker Stanford studied this problem in SYK. Um, there's been works looking at the onset of random matrix theory in sort of physical systems, you know, how locality, et cetera, intervenes and how you, you know, need to wait long enough for the random matrix behavior to appear. And we'll discuss that in detail in this talk. And then an important role we played in our analysis by this theory of fluctuating hydrodynamics, which has been developed in the last, you know, I don't know, five plus years. Uh, by many different authors. I just list some of the key early papers here. Um, and I'll, I'll explain again later what's going on here, just, just to alert you that this literature is there. Okay, so let, let's get started with the, the main part of the talk. And let me introduce you to random matrix theory if you're not familiar with it. So standard simplest kind of random matrix ensemble is you have a random matrix H, maybe a random Hermitian matrix. It may have some extra symmetries. It may be like a real even or, or, or just complex and Hermitian. And you have some potential V, which defines a measure. And the probability of the matrix is proportional to um, this sort of uniform measure over all the elements and this potential. And if the potential is quadratic, then this is called a Gaussian ensemble. And uh, as typically the case, this potential, will, this, this measure will be unitarily invariant or invariant under some uh, change of basis. So you can reduce it to a measure on the eigenvalues. And this is this famous um, measure here. You have a uh, product over all pairs of energies in a polynomial fashion with some parameter bold beta, which is called the Dyson index, and then your potential evaluated on um, the eigenvalues. And if you think of this as like a statistical mechanics problem, it's it's like a gas, like the eigenvalues are particles, and it's a gas of particles with a, a relatively long range interactions from this Jacobian, which changes you from the uh, the uh, matrix elements themselves to the energy eigenvalues, right? So this is like a Jacobian, which implements that change of coordinates. And you see this Jacobian has the property that it discourages nearest neighbor um, collisions of eigenvalues. So when they get too close together, the measure goes to zero. So that's level repulsion. But also it's, if you think about it, exponentiating this term, it's like logarithmic interactions between different eigenvalues, which is why it's sometimes called a Coulomb gas. And logarithmic interaction is relatively long range interaction. So this is actually a quite stiff and incompressible gas of particles in the statistical language. And that incompressibility gives rise to a stiff um, energy, energy correlation function, two point correlation function, which in the time domain is corresponding precisely to this linear ramp here. So there's at early time, a form factor, a slope, which is kind of non-universal. I mean, you get some answer for random matrix theory, but it depends on the details. But then after a relatively short time, this ramp emerges and then the ramp is just perfectly linear out to exponential times where you get what's called the plateau. And that's just the place where you're beyond even the nearest neighbor separation. All the energies are kind of uncorrelated basically and, um, you just have this, this sum here just reduces to a diagonal, a diagonal sum, which just counts the total dimension of the Hilbert space. So the special form factor starts out as the dimension squared. At late time, it's just the dimension itself. And then in this intermediate regime, it has this linear ramp, which is a reflection of the long range level repulsion of these eigenvalues. And then it can be convenient to introduce this filter function F, 
which lets us say put sort of temperature into the game or zero in on a particular part of the spectrum if we want. That's a very convenient thing to do. And this way we can kind of diagnose different parts of the spectrum or we can look at the whole thing by just setting F equal to one. So here's a little bit more about that. If you uh, just take a generic F and you compute the spectral form factor in a random matrix, you get the following prediction. So it should be an integral over energy, the filter function, which is the function of energy squared, time, and then pi over this Dyson index. So this is like a totally universal, I mean, this, this is the result of random matrix theory. And what's very remarkable is that you go to your favorite spin chain or quantum field theory where you can calculate this and you find exactly the same formula down to all the factors of pi and so forth. And just one comment, um, sometimes people talk about thermal spectral form factors, meaning they take this, this filter function to be the Boltzmann factor. But contrary to your expectation, that doesn't actually zero in on a particular energy window, just because of the way the spectral form factor works in this regime. It actually still is sensitive to the whole spectrum. To really zero in, you should use something like a Gaussian filter or some kind of hard filter. Um, and I won't dwell on this, but it, it can be technically useful. It can clear, clean up the correlations and kind of get rid of some edge cases that are harder to deal with. But I, I, won't, I won't dwell on that. But that's something you can incorporate and, and it enters in a pretty simple way. OK. Now, let me define this important concept of the Thales time. We can speak about spectral form factor as like the Fourier transform of the two-point function of energies. And we know from generic considerations that we can think about the disconnected two-point function, which is just a product of one-point functions, and the connected one, which is kind of the essential correlation. And uh, this plot here shows the disconnected and connected um, SFF. So the disconnected is the blue, the connected is the orange, the disconnected just dies away, and the connected is what has this non-trivial correlation between the, the levels. And the, the the connected is nice because it subtracts away this, this kind of uh, short time physics. And then we can define the Thales time as just the time it takes for whatever your actual system is to be close to this connected pure random matrix form factor. So typically at very late time, it will be close, but at earlier time, because of locality or conservation laws or whatever, you won't have exactly the random matrix result and the time scale to reach the random matrix behavior is called the Thales time. So one of the goals of the theory will be to compute this time for various systems. And uh, here indeed I say that very thing. So our, our goal in this talk is really to understand what I'll call the hydrodynamic regime, sort of the regime where the really short time details have gone away, but there are still possibly slow modes like diffusing modes or sound modes in the system that have the very low frequency excitations. And so we want to understand that kind of universal physics of those hydrodynamic modes, how they affect this spectral form factor, and then how they eventually cross over into the pure random matrix regime. And we're not going to talk about the very early time regime at all. It's very model dependent. And we're not going to talk about the very late time regime either. The, the, the plateau regime in particular is sort of, sort of, I would say, almost trivial to understand microscopically. But it may be hard to understand from the point of view of like semi-classical methods or hydrodynamic methods, which we'll, we'll talk about here. So it's both sort of mysterious and not mysterious. But in, in any event, it's not something we're going we're gonna to think about. Here. Question, Moran? How should we think about the this Thales time in comparison with scrambling time? Is it supposed to be shorter time scale? It's, it's 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 of the same order or longer, I guess. Depends on how you define scrambling exactly, but the Thales time would be like the is roughly like the global equilibration time. So you would need like you you would need to have reached global thermal equilibrium in some precise sense before this random matrix behavior can be seen. Because you said something. So you said that uh, we, should, we should start seeing the uh, random matrix model, uh, random matrix behavior, which is expected to be at least uh, log S time scale. But then you said that 
you uh, you want this you mentioned you want you mentioned that something else has to survive you said that there should be some uh, you said all the conserved charges this all the conserved stuff disappear yeah but okay maybe maybe i should let you go ahead so it, you, it's basically it, you're saying that it's basically about the scrambling time yeah if, if i define scrambling time as as like sort of the old-fashioned way meaning just the time to reach total equilibrium like the time for all entropies to saturate, all like charges and energy to equalize everywhere in the system, then then yeah, that that, that will be the Taoist time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so so that's the that's the question. So let's talk about what's the issue with you know sort of actual systems that are not random matrices, why do they deviate from random matrix behavior? Um, and the simplest reason why is because they have a large number of slow modes. So imagine you take your, your favorite system. Um, in my case, I usually imagine a spin chain, but it could be a quantum field theory. Um, let's suppose it has spatial locality. So it's extended in, in one or more dimensions. And we break all the other symmetry. So all that remains is energy conservation, right? Now, on pretty general grounds, you would expect such a system to have at least one slow mode corresponding to the diffusion of energy. OK, so energy will diffuse slowly throughout the system. That's just a consequence of the conservation law. You know, it, it could be in the right conditions, you know, even slower than diffusive, like if you have disorder. But let's just say diffusion is a pretty generic situation if I've broken translation symmetry. Um, then at a given fixed time, there'll be a characteristic wave vector, which I hear called KT, um, which is just set by the fusion constant D and the time according to this formula. So this is just taking the, the diffusive decay rate, which is D times K squared, and say that equal to one over a time. And that defines this characteristic wave vector. And then all the modes with wave vectors smaller than this KT have barely decayed. They decayed by less than one over E from their initial value, less than one E fold. So at this moment in time, all the wave, all the modes with wave vector less than this KT have barely decayed. And if you count the number of such modes for any fixed time, not scaling with the system size, there's an extensive number of them. So in other words, at any moment in time in this system, any sort of moment in time, as you take the system size to infinity, there's an extensive number of almost conserved quantities. Right, now that's definitely not something which is true about a random matrix. And so this is an important distinction between this physical local system and an actual random matrix. And you could expect that if each of these sectors, which is almost conserved, meaning there's no matrix elements between one sector and another sector, if each of these sectors is itself random matrix-like, then the special form factor would just add up. It would just be like a sum of a bunch of different little small random matrices. The special form factor is like a variance. We already said it, the two-point function. Variance is add. So you would just think that the special form factor would be the linear ramp times the number of these sectors. OK? So you would expect it to be something like um, the linear ramp times e to this number of modes. Because the amplitude of each mode, the collection of all those amplitudes labels the sectors. So that's the prediction. The special form factor would be linear ramp times e to this number of modes, which has this characteristic form here. OK, can we make that more precise? Because it's not like they're totally independent. There is some coupling, and they do eventually decay. So how does that work? And that prompted us to think about a sort of generic situation where you have like a block Hamiltonian which I call H naught, and then some other perturbation, which I call V, that causes transitions. So think about this, as a, this is like a, we're stepping back for a second, thinking about a very general kind of quantum mechanics problem. Just have some general Hamiltonian H naught, which has these decoupled blocks labeled by alpha. And I have some other matrix V that causes transitions. And so as I just argued to you, the special form factor without 
without V, without the transitions, would just be this random matrix result times the number of sectors. And then if you go and ask, what's the actual full spectral form factor? Well, if you think about the formula in terms of return amplitudes, we just need to, again, calculate return amplitudes. And now, because of this matrix V, this perturbation V here, um, what we have is if you start with a state in some particular block labeled by alpha and some particular state within that block labeled by I, then at some time T, that state will now have spread to other blocks labeled by beta with some probability that I call probability from alpha to beta, that's the symbol. And then there'll be some sort of fine grained state within that block. Right. So this is a complicated notation, which just says I start at some particular state in some block. After a while, I transition to other blocks, and I'm in some particular state in those different other blocks. Right. And this is the coherent superposition of these different possibilities with the square root of the probability as the amplitude. And then from this, you can calculate, just plug into the formula, calculate the return amplitude. That involves the probability to go from a block back to itself. And then this sort of within block matrix element. So now we just assemble all the pieces. We sum up all these amplitudes for different initial states. That's summing over all alpha and all i. And then we square it, take the absolute square, and then we average. And to complete the calculation, we need to make an assumption about the way different terms in the double sum interact. And what we assume is that the different blocks are decoupled after the average, okay, which kind of makes sense. They, they, they don't talk to each other at this, at this level. It's just the dynamics within a block. And we say that the two blocks essentially are uncorrelated with each other. And so that means- So Brian, quick yeah. question about the last slide. Yep. So you took V to this perturbation to be generic, right? Mm -hmm. So the, your, the transition amplitude from one sector to the other sector is not going to be just square root of a probability. There could be phases, right? So Yeah, good. Um, there could be phases. I, I'm going to absorb those phases into this quantity, this, this state here. I can always do that. So the, the only important assumption is that the magnitude of this amplitude here does not depend on the detailed state I. It just depends on the sectors. So that's kind of the genericity assumption that like basically within a sector, I have random matrix behavior say, so I kind of, it doesn't matter which state I have because they're all well mixed. And then I could have transitions between one sector to another sector, but it only depends on the initial and final sector and not on the detailed state within the sector. Is this some, some sort of like a classical uh, probability distribution for each state to join so, 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 some sort of a classical limit? Yeah, it, it's, it's sort of like, like roughly speaking, you get these probabilities by doing like Fermi's golden rule calculation. And so it's like a, like a stochastic transition matrix where you hop from one sector to another sector, but in an incoherent okay, way because you have this like random matrix structure within each sector. All right, thank you. Yep. So it's really, you know, at a, at, a, at a technical level, the assumption is that this quantity does not depend on I and that this average statement is true. If you have those two things, then the final result follows, in which case you find the spectral form factor of the system is sort of the spectral form factor of each sector, alpha, and then times this probability to go from the sector back to itself. So the return probability, which again, I think makes intuitive sense, but it's nice to see that there's kind of a sharp mathematical argument that you can use to get there. And so what we need to compute then in general would be if we know the spectral form factors of the sectors separately, say if they're all random matrix-like, we just need to calculate these return probabilities. And already at this stage, you can say, well, that's a natural job for hydrodynamics, right? Hydrodynamics is like the theory of fluctuating hydrodynamics is the theory of fluctuating diffusion or whatever, whatever you have in your system. And it can compute for me these return probabilities. So it should be natural already that hydrodynamics enters into the story, at least in terms of the calculation of these return probabilities. 
Now, let's see an example of that. So here I'm considering the problem of linear diffusion, but linear diffusion with fluctuations. So imagine that I'm thinking about energy diffusion, but there's also a stochastic noise term, which induces fluctuations, but is consistent with energy conservation. Okay. Um, if you work through the math of that, what you'll find is that the probability distribution of an amplitude of energy fluctuation with the wave vector k at some time t is a Gaussian distribution where the mean is the initial value of that fluctuation amplitude decayed by the appropriate decay rate. This gamma k would just be d times k squared, just the diffusive decay rate. And then there's a variance, sigma squared, which you can calculate, but we don't actually need here. So I just left it implicit. All right. So it's a Gaussian centered around the decayed value to get from solving the diffusion equation, but there's also some variance because of the stochastic fluctuation. And now if I want to compute these return probabilities, all I need to do is ask, well, I want the final energy to equal the initial energy. And I want to sum over all the sectors, which corresponds to integrating over the initial value of the energy. And that calculation you can just do, and you get this kind of uh, like Bose-like factor here, one over one minus the decay rate. And then the sum over all the sectors corresponds in the usual way to a product over different wave vectors of this factor. Here I've plugged in the fact that the, um, the decay rates are just D, the diffusion constant times K squared, the wave vector squared, and then that's time. And if you go to the quasi-continuous regime and evaluate this product as a sum after taking a log, you get exactly this formula. Volume, some characteristic diffusive link scale here, and then like a zeta function at some place. So you get almost exactly what we, what we guessed you should get just from this conserved mode picture, but the numerical factors are a little bit different and they come from properly evaluating this, this um, um, return probabilities. Okay, so this is this is one of our main results, and it it uh, reobtains a result that had been derived in one dimension for a special Floquet model in the limit of large onside dimension. So in some special limit, people have gotten this formula in with little d equals one, and here we're showing that it holds in any dimension. It just follows from diffusion and from this return probability formula. And now you can say, well, what's the Thales time? Well, if I want this to be random matrix-like, it means this sum of a return probability should just be close to one, right? And so if I take a time which is longer, which is sort of proportional to the time scale of the slowest mode, that's the mode whose wave vector is two pi over system size, if you have a periodic box, and then I have some, you know, depending on how close I want to be, some epsilon. If I take a time of order of this, then this return probability is within one plus epsilon of unity. And so, you know, if I, depending on how close I want to be to the random matrix result, I need to go to a certain time scale. But this quantifies precisely that time scale and how you approach the random matrix behavior. And here is some numerical data. This is not our data. This is data from the other paper I referenced in the previous slide by Friedman et al. There's the archive number. They studied a spin chain, a flow K spin chain. So it's like a unitary evolution that you repeat, like a stack unitary. So it's not a Hamiltonian, but just, uh, just a unitary. And it has a conserved U1, which is diffusing, a conserved charge. And as I said, theoretically they showed in 1D with large on-site dimension. So they take some kind of something like a large in limit sort of, and they can derive that equation. And they also did numerics at finite on-site dimension, and they got the following data. So here they're plotting on the x-axis time and units of L squared. That's natural because one over L squared is the diffusive time scale, the slowest mode. So it's like time over the thallus time. That's what they're plotting here. And then on the y-axis, they're applying the spectral form factor. That's what they call a k divided by t. So that's the form factor divided by the ramp. 
and they're taking the log. So what you would expect is just the log of this expression here. And they show this for different system sizes. The, 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 the two important points are that the data roughly collapse onto one curve for different system size, provided you, you do this scaling, this T over L squared scaling. And this black curve is the previous formula for some value of diffusion constant D, which they fit. And that formula agrees pretty well with uh, this data. Okay. Not perfectly well. And you, know, you can ask an interesting question about what causes the deviation. But there's, you know, it's good qualitative agreement at least. And so the, the moral of the story is spectral form factor is enhanced at early time. But as you let diffusion happen, as the system reaches global equilibrium, it approaches at late time just the pure random matrix ramp. And the preceding theory gives you a quantitative accounting of how that approach happens. Can I ask a question? Please. So the diffusion constant in, in your model, does it come from this term V, these different rates, or it's something that uh, each block in your Hamiltonian has? Uh, yeah, it, it, it really, I guess I would say it comes from the Vs. It has to do with the rates of transition. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's related to the fact that these different energy fluctuations do relax. They're not perfectly conserved. And so, yeah, in that model, it would sort of, the, the, the diffusion constant comes from the V term. Okay, so you can calculate microscopically what, what D is. Well, in, that's, a, that's a tough question, yeah. In our paper, we have some toy models of this H naught plus V kind of setting. And there, yeah, we can calculate what mm -hmm. the analog of D is. For example, just using Fermi's golden rule. But in a like sort of mini body model without that nice structure, where the decomposition of H naught and V is not obvious, actually computing the diffusion constant is a hard problem. Mm -hmm. And we have ideas about how to do that and, and some methods. Other people have thought about this as well. Um, but that's a different talk. I'm happy to discuss it afterwards. Um, it's a very interesting problem. It's a hard problem. And people think about it, you know, in quantum matter, in QCD, like quark gluon plasma, this kind of issue comes up everywhere. So it's, it's a very challenging and interesting question. Okay, thanks. Okay. Great. So where we are now is we've seen this right now. That's another energy. question. Yeah, um, please. So you mentioned in, in passing that in this numerics, they took a large a number of uh, the on-site dimension to be large. Can you say a few words about that? That is that to make a separation between scales or? Yeah, so, it, so in the numerics, the on-site dimension is finite. It's like two or three, but they also had a theory of this spectral form factor where the on-site dimension is large. And there, the purpose is to, you basically map the spectral form factor to like a statistical problem, like a stat neck problem. So like imagine you're doing, um, you know, like imaginary time path integral sort of thing. You have some kind of effective stat neck model that comes from your quantum devolution. There's the same kind of thing happens here. And in the limit of large on-site dimension, they can control that model. So like it turns into some, in this case, it turns into a, a 2D stat neck model where there's a transfer matrix related to the XXZ quantum spin chain. I see, to solve the So it's, it's a way to solve that model. Okay, thank you. And you know, like this XXZ spin chain is like a ferromagnetic spin chain. And so the, the ferromagnetic magnons, which if you've ever done any condensed matter, you know, disperse like K squared are sort of playing the role of the diffusive fluctuations. Thanks. Yep. Okay. So we've seen this random matrix behavior in action. We've understood now from this return probability point of view, how we can calculate corrections to it. And I focus on a simple case of diffusion, but you can imagine that formula looks quite general. So I could take whatever my favorite theory is or whatever theory applies to my system of interest and compute those return probabilities and uh, evaluate this enhancement factor. 
But now I want to take in the last little bit here, try to put everything together and give you a unified kind of quantum field theory framework for thinking about this, a sort of effective field theory of spectral statistics. And to do that, I'm going to call upon this theory of fluctuating hydro. So uh, very, very briefly, what's the idea here? Um, the idea is, first of all, we're interested in a generating function, which I've written here, a generating function of correlators, real-time correlators, not Euclidean correlators, but real-time correlators. And what I have is an initial state rho, and then a sort of forward evolution u1 and a backward evolution u2. I give them different names because in principle, you can consider different background fields on the different contours. So some forward contour background fields and some backward contour background fields. And by differentiating this generating function with respect to those background fields, you can produce any time over correlation function that you like. So response functions like commutators, other kinds of correlators, you can all obtain by differentiating this generating function with respect to those background fields. So in particular, you take your favorite system, you couple the energy current and energy density to a background field, which is like a metric sort of, or if it's a U1, like a, like a background gauge field, you compute this generating function, and then you take derivatives with respect to those background fields, and you get your correlators. So that's a nice general formalism. And um, the idea of, you know, this is like Schwinger Keldish or NN, or if you're doing classical physics, Martin Sicky Rose related uh, is a related idea. So, anyways, you have this structure. And the idea of the closed time path formalism or this fluctuating hydrodynamics formalism is that we want to formulate an effective theory of this generating function. So, we want to integrate out the fast stuff, keep the slow stuff, the hydrodynamic modes and have an effective field theory that governs their physics. And the nice thing about this is this effective field theory obeys a lot of rules from the structure of these contours. And because it's really an effective field theory with fluctuations, we can compute fluctuation effects. We can compute loop effects, which can be important in hydro. They can give you new phenomena. So this is really like an attempt, a beautiful way of approaching hydrodynamics as a proper effective field theory, where you can include loop effects systematically and investigate a variety of different uh, physical phenomena. And okay, as I said, there's some rules. Uh, first of all, it's convenient to think about two types of variables, what are called R type and A type. You can think about there being a set of fields, phi one on contour one and phi two on contour two. And the R type variables are like phi one plus phi two, so the symmetric variables, and A type are phi one minus phi two, so the anti-symmetric. R is also called classical sometimes, and A is called quantum, depending on the community. And so you have rules like if the uh, A type fields vanish, meaning the contours are equal, then the effective action should vanish. Because basically, if you have the same background fields on both contours, then U1 just cancels U2 dagger and you get identity. And so here's a typical kind of effective action at the quadratic level that you'd have. And again, for energy diffusion, you have you know, your phi r and phi a, which you can think of as sort of like um, maps from sort of internal time to like from fluid time to physical time, sort of like a Eulerian versus Lagrangian view of dynamics, but basically maps from sort of an internal clock of the system to the physical time. And um, by studying how those things couple to background fields, you can conclude that the energy density, for example, is the time derivative of the R type variable. And once you plug that in, you get this nice effective action. And, and to understand what's going on here, imagine like computing the equation of motion with respect to phi A, you take a phi A derivative, and what you see here is just the diffusion equation for the energy density plus some extra term proportional to phi a that you can interpret as like a noise term. And in fact, formally, you can uncomplete the square in the path integral and introduce some fluctuating source. And it really is just exactly the theory of fluctuating hydrodynamics at the linearized level, fluctuating diffusion. OK, so this is a very powerful, nice theory. But how does it help us? Well, let's uh, look at this set of contours side by side. 
And uh, what you may notice is that apart from the boundary conditions, they look quite similar. They both have a forward and backward going piece. We could in principle allow different background fields on the forward and backward going piece if we wanted. And so our idea, the, the main idea here is that the same effective action, which governs hydrodynamics, which governs this generating function, can also control the spectral form factor calculation, provided we modify the boundary conditions appropriately. Okay, so that's that's a, a big physical idea. Let me go through it carefully. First of all, it's clear we have to modify the boundary conditions in some way, right? Because in the hydro case, we see that the future contour connects onto the past contour. I mean, the forward going contour connects onto the backward going contour in the far future. That's this little blob, this little dots here. And there's a state in the distant past which connects them there. In the spectral form factor case, the forward going contour just connects onto itself. It's periodic in time and also for the backward going contour. So I definitely have to modify the boundary conditions. But the bulk of the effective action in this region we expect to be the same because that effective action comes from integrating out fast modes. And as long as the length of this contour is much longer than the decay rate of those fast modes, those modes can't wrap this time circle. They can't sense the periodicity. And you would expect to get exactly the same bulk effective action. So the precise assumptions are that we take the same bulk action, we modify the boundary conditions on the fields. This just changes the integration measure a little bit. We assume that this modified hydro action gives a dominant saddle point, so to speak, to the spectral form factor. It means that it dominates that path integral which computes that object. And that there's some averaging like disorder that connects the contours. Because one feature of this hydro action is that it, it involves explicit interaction between the top and bottom, the like forward and backward contours, which is rationalized because you have connections in the past and the far future. But there's no explicit connection here. So we have to have disorder or some kind of averaging which connects these two things. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense. So here's a summary of the idea. In the top panel, I'm talking about the sort of microscopic schwinger keldish contour where I have the thermal part that prepares my density matrix. I have a forward contour and a backward contour. And the idea of hydrodynamics is that I integrate out the fast stuff. I integrate out the thermal contour, et cetera. And I get this effective action, which depends on the energy, like the background energy density, which is set by the thermal part. And it explicitly couples the forward and backward contours. And that's allowed because there's coupling in the past and in the future. And so it's perfectly reasonable that you have this coupling between the, the upper and lower contours. Then on the right, we have spectral form factor contour, the forward and backward. They're decoupled, but I am averaging over the Hamiltonian, say. And there's no thermal factor here, or there's maybe a filter function, but that's it. And so the idea of, of our proposal is that, well, this different contour system is governed by the same effective action, again, because the fast modes can't wrap the circle, but with modified boundary conditions for the slow modes. And where now we sum over energy because there's no thermal factor to fix a particular background energy, so we should just sum over all of them. Or more generally, we put in again this filter function which selects out some energy. So that's the physical argument. Let me show you that it works in the final couple of minutes. Let's first of all talk about the zero mode. So imagine you've got a very long time so that all the finite wave vector modes have decayed and we just have the zero mode. That reduces to this very simple Lagrangian, which involves just the zero modes, spatial zero modes of phi A and, and the energy density. So it's just the total energy and like the total time shift between the two contours, essentially. And now, OK, you, you carefully regulate the path integral. You, you define the measure in a, in a sort of reasonable way. And what you find is then that this zero modes exactly give you a factor of time times an integral over the total energy. And that's exactly what you want to get random matrix to. Where does this time come from? 
Well, again, in the hydro case, the relative time shift of the forward contour and backward contour are fixed to be zero by the future boundary condition, right? The zero frequency time shift is just constrained to vanish because they have to match in the far future. But in this structural form factor context, there's no explicit connection. So you have a free relative time shift between the forward and backward contour. And that's exactly what this T is. It's just the zero mode of this phi A, which again, if you go through the details, corresponds to like the relative time shift. And then the zero mode of energy is just the overall energy of the system. And you should integrate over that because there's no constraint or you can put the filter function in then you have the filter function. You can also repeat this for multiple powers of time evolution, like multiple powers of this partition function. And if you then pair them up into pairs that form this sort of hydro, this modified hydro saddle point, what you predict is like, say for, for a system with Gaussian unitary symmetry, for, with unitary symmetry, that you would get a factor of K factorial times this SFF to the K. And that's exactly what you would predict for a Gaussian unitary ensemble. Okay. So just by pairing up different contours and using these zero modes, you exactly reproduce what you expect for a Gaussian unitary right of matrix ensemble. And hints of this structure were sort of previously observed in SYK by Schadsenker of Stanford. But I think we really highlighted the hydrodynamic character of this argument and its generality. Like it's something that applies to any hydrodynamic system at long times. And then you can go back and do the path integral um, with all the finite wave vector modes. And lo and behold, you exactly reproduce this. Um, return probability formula that I argued for you before and, and showed you the calculation of on a previous slide. So this hydrodynamic path integral with the same action but modified under conditions exactly reproduces the ramp and the approach from the ramp that we got from our microscopic quantum mechanical calculation. And now I'm basically out of time, so I'll just skip this final bit, but you can look at interactions in the theory. That's an interesting thing to do. And there's a lot of new features because you have this periodic time now. So interactions that normally vanish in the theory of fluctuating hydrodynamics are now non-zero, and you get all kinds of new effects, which in principle at large enough size can modify the scaling with time and system size. But I'd say this is really an, an open area which we don't fully understand yet. Okay, so that's a, an area for further, further development. And let me just move now to the outlook. So what I think the takeaway is, is that hydrodynamics in this fluctuating effective field theory sense really implies chaos in the spectral sense. In particular, I argue for the zero modes give you the ramp, the random matrix ramp, and the non-zero modes compute return probabilities. And I apply it to the simplest case of energy diffusion, but you can imagine that it could be applicable to a much wider variety of physical systems. The zero mode is going to be the same, and then the non-zero modes are going to depend on the details of what kind of mode you have in your system. There's also various instances in which this formalism predicts universality. It says at very late time, if you change the Hamiltonian, this corresponds to a certain kind of expectation that just naturally vanishes in these hydro theories, the so-called A-type expectation. It cannot vanish if you have the time periodicity mattering, which happens at earlier time, but at very late time where all the modes have decayed, then these A type expectations should vanish. And so you again, expect universality. You expect that this thing does not depend on the Hamiltonian. It just depends on say the symmetry class. Um, and there's some other comments here. Well, I'll skip those and just wrap up by saying, you know, what we kind of argued for here is, is a sharp connection between two different manifestations of chaos. And one thing you'd very much like to do is to make other connections to other manifestations like eigenstate thermalization, complexity growth, et cetera. And more generally to produce a kind of synthesis, like what's the big picture idea of quantum chaos. At a practical level, we provided some tools to calculate spectral form factors in systems with slow modes. Um, in the paper that I talked about here, we have 
applications to like flow K systems, for example, you can see a crossover between like a Hamiltonian ramp to a unitary ramp. We were wrote another paper where we looked at symmetry breaking. So there you get interesting structure with uh, symmetries and so you see how symmetry breaking is restored at finite volume and how that affects spectral form factor. We have work in progress on glasses. And we're also thinking about, you know, how it's modified when you have sound waves. So there's all kinds of interesting directions we're continuing to work on this. I think some of the really interesting questions include, you know, is there like a hydro theory of the plateau? Can we go to longer time? Can we understand more about the higher moments, like higher cumulants? What, what controls the non-Gaussianity? And, you know, what about interaction? We need to understand those much better to really um, say we fully understand this formula. For example, can we compute systematic corrections that explain the deviation seen in that numerical data? That's still an open question. But with that, let me say thanks for your attention. Happy to take additional questions. Thanks so much, for Brian. Are there any questions? Um, can I ask about uh, one question? Um, this might be a naive question, but um, uh, have you uh, seen, have you calculated the chaos bound in the spectral form factor that you proposed? Is this... this chaos bound? Oh, so okay. I yeah. Think, um, so I think Schenker or Douglas Stanford previously have calculated the chaos bound in some cases using the OTOC. Yeah. And since you're proposing the spectral form factor as like um, bare bone form of you know uh, like uh, this measure of chaos, you think it's it provides like improved burden of bound or you have any guess? Um, I don't think what I've said here directly relates to the bound on chaos. Okay. Um, what, what I do think, of, and something we're working on now is, you know, I, I argue that this sort of two contour theory of hydrodynamics should control spectral form factor, which is like the second cumulant. Okay. You might think that a four contour theory Mm -hmm. Hydro-like theory should control the fourth cumulant. But again, when you change the boundary conditions. And that four contour theory knows about chaos, right? It knows about out of time order correlators. I so, see, I see. so our idea is that non-Gaussianity as evidence in the fourth cumulant should know about OTOX, among other things. And the bound on chaos might feature there. I see. Uh, so okay. far, we don't, we haven't figured out the complete story there. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? I do have a question, actually. So when your comparison between the um, U1, trace of U1 row U2 yeah. with uh, this average on uh, ensemble, this uh, distorted average trace of U1, uh, UU dagger. Yeah. Um, so you said something about how you treated row. It's not like you split the row into row half, putting it each in uh, one side. You summed over energies. Can you bring, I think you had it on one of the slides. Yeah. Um, that point was a little bit, yeah, okay, there we go. So you sum over energies here. If is there any way to incorporate like factors of, I don't know, row half in each of the contours or? Yeah, yeah, you can absolutely do that. Um, so, so yeah, again, the, like the, the big picture idea here is that the main role of the thermal contour is to set the background energy density. Like it, it determines the background energy or temperature, if you like, at which you're operating and the diffusion constant, et cetera, can depend on that energy. And here we don't have that naively, or, or if we do, it's this filter function. And so what we should get instead is not a single energy, but a sum over energies, but possibly weighted by that filter function. So that, that filter function, you can choose to whatever you want. And in particular, you could choose it to be like row one half if you wanted to. And that would compute for you these like thermal SFFs. And the, the way that would enter the theory is just as an extra term here, like in the measure or an extra insertion into the path integral, which depends on the zero mode. 
I, I guess maybe maybe I'm a little bit confused. Like if instead of in this uh, instead of picking the thermal uh, contour on the left, you yeah. could have picked any initial state and any final state, and you could have had you know like some sort of evolution between different states. Yeah. What is the what is the rule for going from the left to the right side? So because by by picking different initial and final states, what I'm doing is I'm changing the boundary conditions at you know, early time and late time. Now you're you wanna yeah. You want to go from yeah. those connected boundary conditions to disconnected and replacing it, saying that averaging does the job of connecting the two. That's right, yeah. But averaging is, is are the details of the initial final state encoded supposedly in the measure, the disorder measure that you're averaging with, or what is the, yeah? Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, this, this is a good question. It's a, it's a complicated question. I, I would say, the fact that we're averaging over all states is why we get such a simple answer on the right hand side. And so And so on, on the left hand side, you know, yeah, you could put a particular initial state here and you'd have a different problem. You know, you know something where that initial state first thermalizes locally and then maybe you see longer time hydrodynamic behavior. Um, what you're getting here is you can, you can think about like summing over all states and going sort of energy block by energy block, like think microcanonically. And within each energy block, you have summing over all states, which is like this thermal thing at a certain energy density. And so we would get the hydrodynamic effective action for that energy density with the diffusion constant and compressibility, et cetera that depend on that energy density over here, but we'd also have to sum over all energies because we're summing over all initial states. But because we're summing over all of them democratically, we don't single out any special initial state. And that's why there's no like initial state dependence here. And the right thing to do over here is to compare it to the thermal answer where we have an equilibrium state. I see, so you're saying that uh, the details of the initial state go into uh, replacing that sum over energies with some sort of weighted sum and you're still you're you're still averaging with the Gaussian ensemble whatever is the your disorder average is you're not gonna yeah, change yeah. that yeah okay thank you yep any other questions for Brian if not let's thank Brian for the wonderful talk um, thank you and yeah thanks so much for joining us uh, we'll, we'll post the video on YouTube. Um, thanks so much, Brian. My pleasure. Nice to see you all. Yeah. Take care. See ya.